Where do you need to grow? When change happens, you can either cooperate with it and learn how to benefit from it, or you can resist it and eventually get run over by it. It's your choice. When you embrace change wholeheartedly as an inevitable part of life, looking for ways to use new changes to make your life richer, easier, and more fulfilling, your life will work much better. You will experience change as an opportunity for growth and new experiences. Several years ago, I was hired to consult with the Naval Sea Systems Command in Washington, D.C. They had just announced they were moving the entire command to San Diego, California, which meant that a lot of civil service jobs were going to be lost in that transition. My job was to conduct a seminar for all the non-military personnel who would not be moving to California. And though the Naval Sea Systems Command had offered everyone jobs and transfers to San Diego, including reimbursement of all moving expenses, or assistance in locating a new job in the Washington, D.C. area, many of the employees had become almost frozen with fear and resentment. Though nearly all of them looked at this change as a major disaster in their lives, I encouraged them to look at it as an opportunity, as something new. I taught them about E plus R equals O, and how, although the move to San Diego, E was inevitable. Their outcome, O, whether or not they flourished afterward, was entirely dependent on their response, R, to the situation. Perhaps you'll find a more empowering job in D.C., I said, or even get a job with better pay. Or maybe you would like to move to California where it's warm most of the year and new friends and adventures are awaiting you. Slowly, they began to move from panic and fear to realizing that things could indeed work out, maybe even for the better, if only they embraced this change as an opportunity to create something new and better for themselves. How to Embrace Change Realize that there are two kinds of change, cyclical change and structural change, neither of which you can control. Cyclical change, such as the change we see in the stock market, happens several times a year. Prices go up and they go down. There are bull markets and corrections. We see seasonal changes in the weather increased spending during the holidays, more travel in the summer, and so on. These are changes that happen in cycles, and we just accept them as a normal part of life. But there are also structural changes, such as when the computer was invented and the Internet was created, and both of these technologies completely changed how we live, work, get our news, and make purchases. Structural changes like these are the kinds of changes where there is no going back to doing things the way they were before, and these are the kinds of changes that can sweep you away if you resist them. Like the Naval Sea Systems Command employees, FTD florists, or the railroad industry, will you embrace these structural changes and work to improve your life, or will you resist them? Remember back to a time when you experienced a change but resisted. Perhaps it was a move, a job transfer, a change in suppliers, a change in technology in your company, a change in management, or even your teenager going off to college. A change you were going to have to deal with, and you thought it was the worst thing in your world. What happened once you surrendered to the change? Did your life actually improve? Can you look back now and say, Wow, I'm glad that happened. Look at the good it eventually brought me. If you can always remember that you've been through changes in the past, and that they've largely worked out for the best, you could begin to approach each new change with the excitement and anticipation you should. To help embrace any change, ask yourself the following questions. What's changing in my life that I'm currently resisting? Why am I resisting that change? What am I afraid of with respect to this change? What am I afraid might happen to me? What's the payoff for my keeping things the way they are? What's the cost I'm paying for keeping things the way they are? What benefits might be there in this change? What would I have to do to cooperate with this change? What's the next step I could take to cooperate with this change? When will I take this next step? 
Principle 32 Transform your inner critic into an inner coach. A man is literally what he thinks. James Allen, author of As a Man Thinketh. Research indicates that, on average, people talk to themselves about 50,000 times a day. This includes you. Unfortunately, most of that self-talk is about yourself, and according to the psychological researchers, it is 80% negative. Things such as, I shouldn't have said that. They don't like me. I'm never going to be able to pull this off. I don't like the way my hair looks today. That other team is going to kill us. I can't dance. I'm not a speaker. I'll never lose this weight. I can't ever seem to get organized. I'm always late. Argue for your limitations, and sure enough, they're yours. Richard Bach, author of Jonathan Livingston Siegel. We also know from this research that these thoughts have a powerful effect on us. They affect our attitude, our motivation to act, our physiology, even our biochemistry. Our negative thoughts actually control our behavior. They make us stutter, spill things, forget our lines, break out in a sweat, breathe shallowly, feel anxious or scared, and taken to the extreme, they can even paralyze or kill us. Worried Himself to Death Many years ago, Reader's Digest featured the true story of Nick Sitzman, a strong, healthy, and ambitious young railroad yardman. He had a reputation as a diligent worker and had a loving wife, two children, and many friends. One midsummer day, the train crews were informed that they could quit an hour early in honor of the foreman's birthday. While performing one last check on some of the railroad cars, Nick was accidentally locked in a refrigerator boxcar. When he realized that the rest of the workmen had left the site, Nick began to panic. He banged and shouted until his fists were bloody and his voice was hoarse, but no one heard him. With his knowledge of the numbers and the facts, he predicted the temperature to be zero degrees. Nick's thought was, if I can't get out, I'll freeze to death in here. Wanting to let his wife and family know exactly what had happened to him, Nick found a knife and began to etch words on the wooden floor. He wrote, It's so cold, my body is getting numb. If I could just go to sleep. These may be my last words. The next morning, the crew slid open the heavy doors of the boxcar and found Nick dead. An autopsy revealed that every physical sign of his body indicated he had frozen to death. And yet the refrigeration unit of the car was inoperative, and the temperature inside indicated 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Nick had killed himself by the power of his own thoughts. You, too, if you're not careful, can kill yourself with your limiting thoughts. Not all at once, like Nick Sitzman, but little by little, day after day, until you have slowly deadened your natural ability to achieve your dreams. Your negative thoughts affect your body. We also know from polygraph lie detector tests that your body reacts to your thoughts, changing your temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, breathing rate, muscle tension, and how much your hands sweat. When you are hooked up to a lie detector and are asked a question such as, Did you take the money? Your hands will get colder. Your heart will beat faster. Your blood pressure will go up. Your breathing will get faster, your muscles will get tighter, and your hands will sweat if you did take the money and you lie about it. These kinds of physiological changes occur not only when you are lying, but also in reaction to every thought you think. Every cell in your body is affected by every thought you have. Negative thoughts affect your body negatively, weakening you, making you sweat, and making you uptight. Positive thoughts affect your body in a positive way, making you more relaxed, centered, and alert. Positive thoughts cause the secretion of endorphins in the brain and reduce pain and increase pleasure. Stomp Those Ants Psychiatrist Daniel G. Amen has named the limiting thoughts we hear in our head ants. 
automatic negative thoughts. And just like real ants at a picnic, your ants can ruin your experience of life. Dr. Amen recommends that you learn to stomp the ants. First, you have to become aware of them. Next, you have to shake them off and stomp them by challenging them. Finally, you have to replace them with more positive and affirming thoughts. Don't believe everything you hear, even in your own mind. Daniel G. Amen, M.D. Clinical neuroscientist, psychiatrist, and specialist in attention deficit disorders. The key to dealing with any kind of negative thinking is to realize that you are ultimately in charge of whether to listen or to agree with any thought. Just because you think it or hear it doesn't mean it's true. You want to constantly ask yourself, is this thought helping or hurting me? Is it getting me closer to where I want to go or taking me further away? Is it motivating me to action or is it blocking me with fear and self-doubt? You have to learn to challenge and talk back to the thoughts that are not serving you in creating greater success and happiness. My friend Doug Bench, the author of the Mastery of Advanced Achievement Home Study Course, recommends writing down every negative thought you think or say out loud and every negative thought you hear anyone else say for three whole days. Make sure that two of the days are work days and that one is a weekend day. Ask your spouse or partner, children, roommates, and fellow employees to catch you and impose a dollar fine every time they hear you uttering a negative thought. In a recent workshop I conducted, participants had to put two dollars in a bowl every time they said anything that was blaming, justifying, or self-negating. It was amazing to see how fast the bowl filled up. However, as the four days went on, there were fewer and fewer automatic negative comments as everyone became more aware. Different Types of Negative Thoughts It is helpful to understand some of the different kinds of negative thoughts that might attack you. When you recognize these kinds of thoughts, realize they are irrational thoughts that need to be challenged and replaced. Here are some of the most common kinds of negative thoughts and how to eliminate them. Always or never thinking. In reality, very few things are always or never. If you think something is always going to happen, or you will never get what you want, you are doomed from the outset. When you use all or nothing words such as always, never, everyone, no one, every time, and everything, you are usually wrong. Here are some examples of always or never thinking. I'll never get a raise. Everyone takes advantage of me. My employees never listen to me. I never get any time for myself. They're always making fun of me. I never get a break. No one ever cuts me any slack. Every time I take a risk, I get slammed. Nobody cares if I live or die. When you find yourself thinking always or never thoughts, Replace them with what is really true. For example, you can replace, You always take advantage of me, with, I get angry when you take advantage of me, but I know that you have treated me fairly in the past and that you will again. Focusing on the negative. Some people focus only on the bad and never on the good in a situation. When I was conducting trainings for high school teachers, I noticed that most of the teachers I met had a pattern of focusing on the negative. If they taught a lesson and thirty kids got it, but four didn't, they would focus on the four who didn't get it and would feel bad, rather than focus on the twenty-six who did get it and feel good. Learn to look for the positive. Not only will it help you feel better, but it will also be a critical component of your creating the success you want. Recently, a friend of mine told me he had seen an interview with a multimillionaire on television who described the turning point in his career as the morning he asked all of his staff to talk about one good thing that had occurred during the past week. At first, all that came up were more complaints, problems, and difficulties. Finally, one employee commented that the UPS driver who delivered packages to the office had applied to college and was going back to school to get his degree 
and how inspired he was by the man's commitment to further his education and pursue his dream in life. Slowly, one employee, and then another, came up with something else that was positive to share. Soon, this became a part of every meeting. Eventually, they had to end the meetings before every positive thing could be recounted. The entire attitude of the company changed from focusing on the negative to focusing on the good, and the business just took off and grew exponentially from that moment on. Learn to play the appreciation game by looking for things to appreciate in every situation. A powerful exercise for building your appreciation muscle is to take seven minutes every morning to write down all the things you appreciate in your life. I recommend this as a daily ritual for the rest of your life. When you actively seek the positive, you become more appreciative and optimistic, which is a requirement for attracting more good and creating the life of your dreams. Look for the good. My wife was recently in an automobile accident. She drove through an intersection where the traffic light was inoperative because of a power outage and hit another car turning across her lane. She could have succumbed to a multitude of automatic negative thoughts. What's wrong with me? I should have been paying better attention. I shouldn't have been out driving when the power was out. Instead, she focused on the positive. I'm so lucky to be alive and relatively unhurt. The other driver is alive and well. Thank God I was in such a safe car. I am so glad the police came as fast as they did. It's amazing how many people were there to help. This was a real wake-up call. Catastrophic Predicting In catastrophic predicting, you create the worst possible scenario in your mind and then act as if it were a certainty. This could include predicting that your sales prospect won't be interested in your product. The person you are attracted to will reject your request to go out on a date. Your boss won't give you a raise, or the plane you're flying on will crash. Replace, she'll probably laugh at me if I ask her out for a date, with, I don't know what she'll do. She might say yes. Mind Reading You are mind reading when you believe you know what another person is thinking, even though he or she hasn't told you. You know your mind reading when you're thinking thoughts such as, He's mad at me. She doesn't like me. He's going to say no. He's going to fire me. Replace mind reading with the truth. I don't know what he is thinking unless I ask him. Maybe he's just having a bad day. Remember, unless you're a psychic, you can't read anyone else's mind. You don't ever know what they're really thinking unless they tell you or unless you ask them. Check out your assumptions by asking, I'm imagining you might be mad at me, are you? Remember the phrase, when in doubt, check it out, to remind yourself to ask rather than assume you know. Guilt tripping Guilt happens when you think words such as should, must, ought to, or have to. Here are some examples. I ought to spend more time studying for my bar exam. I should spend more time at home with my kids. I have to exercise more. As soon as you feel like you should do something, you create an internal resistance to doing it. I will not should on myself today, seen on a poster. You will be more effective if you replace guilt-tripping with phrases such as, I want to, it supports my goals to, it would be smart to, it's in my interest to. Guilt is never productive. It will stand in the way of achieving your goals, so get rid of this emotional barrier to success. Labeling Labeling is attaching a negative label to yourself or someone else. It is a form of shorthand that stops you from clearly making the finer distinctions that would help you be more effective. Some examples of negative labels are jerk, idiot, arrogant, and irresponsible. When you use a label like this, you are lumping yourself or someone else into a category of all the jerks or idiots you have ever known, and that makes it more difficult to deal with that person or situation as the unique person or experience they are. Challenge the thought, I am stupid, with, 
What I just did was less than brilliant, but I am still a smart person. All meaning is self-created. Virginia Satir, noted psychotherapist known for her contributions in the fields of family therapy and self-esteem. Personalizing You personalize when you invest a neutral event with personal meaning. Kevin hasn't called me back yet. He must be mad at me. Or, we lost the Vanderbilt account. It must be my fault. I should have spent more time on the proposal. The truth is that there are many other possible explanations for other people's actions besides the negative reasons your automatic negative thoughts come up with. For example, Kevin may not have called you back because he is sick, out of town, or overwhelmed with his own priorities. You never really know why other people do what they do. Talk to yourself like a winner. You are today where your thoughts have brought you. You will be tomorrow where your thoughts take you. James Allen, author of As a Man Thinketh. What if you could learn to always talk to yourself like a winner instead of a loser? What if you could transform your negative self-talk into positive self-talk? What if you could silence your thoughts of lack and limitation and replace them with thoughts of unlimited possibility? What if you could replace any victim language in your thoughts with the language of empowerment? And what if you could transform your inner critic, who judges your every move, into a supportive inner coach who would encourage you and give you confidence as you faced new situations and risks? Well, all of that is possible with a little awareness, focus, and intention. Transforming Your Inner Critic into your inner coach. One of the most powerful exercises for retraining your inner critic is to teach it to tell you the total truth. See Principle 29. Complete the past to embrace the future. Just like your parents disciplined you for your own good, your inner critic really has your best interests in mind when it is criticizing you. It wants you to get the benefit of the better behavior. The problem is that it tells you only part of the truth. When you were a little kid, your parents may have yelled at you and sent you to your room after you did something stupid, like run out in front of a car. Their real communication was, I love you. I don't want you to get hit by a car. I want you to stay around so that you can grow up into a happy and healthy adult. But they delivered only half of the message. What's wrong with you? Were you born without a brain? You know better than to run out into the street when there are cars coming. You're grounded for the next hour. Go to your room and think about what you just did. In their fear of losing you, they expressed only their anger. But underneath the anger were three more layers of message that never got delivered. Fear, specific requests, and love. A complete message would look like this. Anger. I am mad at you for running out into the street without looking to see if any cars were coming. Fear. I am afraid that you'll get badly hurt or killed. Requests. I want you to pay more attention when you are playing near the street. Stop and look both ways before you walk or run out into the street. Love. I love you so much. I don't know what I would do without you. You are so precious to me. I want you to be safe and healthy. You deserve to have lots of fun and stay safe so you can continue to enjoy life to the fullest. Do you understand? What a different message. You need to train your inner critic to talk to you the same way. You can practice this on paper or as a verbal exercise in which you talk to yourself out loud. I usually imagine talking to a clone of myself sitting in an empty chair opposite me. Make a list of all the things you say when you are judging yourself. Include all of the things you tell yourself you should do, but you don't. A typical list might look like this. You don't exercise enough. You're gaining too much weight. You're a fat slob, a real couch potato. You drink too much alcohol and eat too many sweets. You need to cut down on the carbs. You need to watch less television and go to bed earlier. If you got up earlier, you'd have more time to exercise. You're lazy. 
Why don't you finish the things you start? Once you have completed your list, practice communicating the same information using the four-step process outlined above. 1. Anger. 2. Fear. 3. Requests. And 4. Love. Spend a minimum of one minute on each step. Make sure to be very specific in the requests stage. State exactly what you want yourself to do. I want you to eat better is too vague. Be more specific, such as, I want you to eat at least four servings of vegetables every day. I want you to stop eating french fries, sugar, and desserts. I want you to eat eggs and some kind of fruit for breakfast every day. I want you to eat whole grains like whole wheat and brown rice rather than white flour. The more specific you are, the more value you will receive from the exercise. If you do it out loud, which I recommend, do it with as much emotion and passion as possible. Here is an example of what it might sound like using the list of judgments above. Anger I am angry at you for not taking better care of your body. You are such a lazy slob. You drink too much and you eat too much. You don't have any self-discipline. All you do is sit around and watch TV. Your clothes don't fit and you don't look good. Fear if you don't change, I'm afraid you're going to keep gaining weight until you are facing a real health risk. I'm afraid your cholesterol is going to get so high that you might have a heart attack. I'm afraid that you could become diabetic. I'm afraid that you are never going to change, and then you're going to die young and never fulfill your dreams. I'm afraid that if you don't start eating better and taking better care of yourself, no one is going to be attracted to you. You might end up living alone for the rest of your life. Requests I want you to join a health club and go at least three days a week. I want you to go for a 20-minute walk the other four days. I want you to cut out one hour of television a day and devote that to exercise. I want you to stop eating fried foods and start eating more fresh fruits and vegetables. I want you to stop drinking sodas and start drinking more water. I want you to limit drinking alcohol to Friday and Saturday nights. Love I love you. I want you to be around for a long time. I want you to have a wonderful relationship. You deserve to look good in your clothes and to feel good about yourself. You deserve to have all of your dreams come true. I want you to feel alive and energetic rather than tired and lethargic all the time. You deserve to live life fully and enjoy every moment of it. You deserve to be totally happy. Whenever you hear a part of you judging yourself, simply reply, Thank you for caring. What is your fear? What specifically do you want me to do? How will this serve me? Thank you. The first time I experienced this inner critic to inner coach process, it changed my life. After quitting my job at another training company, I had been working as a consultant and a professional speaker. But what I really wanted to do was start my own training company, train other trainers, open offices in other cities, and make a huge difference in the world. But it seemed like such an overwhelming commitment, and I was afraid of failure. What's worse, I had been regularly beating myself up for not having the courage to take the leap. After completing the turning your inner critic into your inner coach exercise, something shifted. I went beyond beating myself up to realize how much I was missing out on by not taking the leap. I told myself clearly what I needed to do, and the following day I outlined a business plan for the new company, asked my mother-in-law for a $10,000 loan, asked a friend to be my business partner, scheduled a meeting to draw up the incorporation papers, and began designing the letterhead. Less than three months later, I conducted my first weekend training in St. Louis for over 200 people. Less than a year later, I had offices in Los Angeles, St. Louis, Philadelphia, San Diego, and San Francisco. Since then, over 50,000 people have participated in my weekend and week-long training programs. By turning my inner critic into an inner coach, I was able to stop feeling like a failure and start engaging in the activities that made my dream a reality. I was able to move from someone who was using my energy against myself 
to someone who is using my energy to create what I wanted. Do not let the seeming simplicity of this technique fool you. It is very powerful. But like everything else in this book, to obtain its value, you must use it. No one else can do it for you. Take twenty minutes now to do the turn your inner critic into your inner coach exercise. Get all of you on your own side, working together for the greater good of your dreams and aspirations. How to Silence Your Performance Critic Have you ever taught a class, given a speech, made a sales presentation, competed in an athletic event, acted in a play, given a concert, or performed any kind of job, and then found yourself on the way home listening to that voice in your head telling you how you messed up, what you should have done differently, how you could have and should have done it better? I'm sure you have. And if you listen to that voice very long, it can undermine your self-confidence, lower your self-esteem, and even demoralize and eventually paralyze you. Here is another simple but powerful method for redirecting your inner voice from one of judgment and criticism to one of correction and support. Remembering again that the deepest underlying motivation of your inner critic is to help you be better at what you do. Tell your inner critic to stop criticizing and berating you, or you will stop listening to it. Tell that inner voice you are not willing to listen to any more character assassinations, name-calling, or brow-beating. Only specific steps you can take to do it better the next time. This eliminates put-downs and focuses the conversation on improvement opportunities for the next occasion. Now the inner critic becomes an inner coach that is simply pointing out ways to improve future results. The past is over, and there is nothing you can do to change it. You can only learn from it and improve your performance the next time. Here is an example of what this might sound like taken from my own life. I see indicates that the inner critic, inner coach, is talking. I see. I can't believe it. What were you thinking? You tried to put way too much information in that seminar. You were talking way too fast, and you were rushed at the end. There's no way people could have assimilated all that information. After all these years as a seminar leader, you think you'd know better than that. Me. Hold on a minute. I'm not going to listen to you criticizing me. I just worked hard all day to give people the best experience that I knew how to create at the time. Now that I've done it, I am sure there are ways to improve it next time. If you have specific things you want me to do next time, then tell me. That is all I am interested in hearing about. I'm not interested in your judgments, just your ideas for how to make it better next time. I see. All right. Next time, pick just three or four major points to focus on, and really drive those points home with examples, humor, and more interpersonal exercises so that people really integrate the material. You can't teach people everything you know in one day. Me. You're right. Anything else? I see. Yes. Make sure to include more interactive learning games in the afternoon when the energy is lower. That'll make sure everyone stays alert and awake. Me. Okay. Anything else? I see. Yes. I think it would work better to take a ten-minute break every hour, rather than a twenty-minute break every two hours. That'll help keep the energy higher and allow more time for people to integrate what they are learning. Me. Good idea. Anything else? I see. Yes. Make sure to integrate some physical activities throughout the day to keep the kinesthetic learners more engaged. Me. Anything else? I see. Yes. Make sure you give people two copies of the Achiever's Focusing Sheet next time, one to write on in the seminar and one to use as a photocopying master after they leave the seminar. Otherwise, they can't really use it could also put a copy on your website that they could download for duplication. Me. Good idea. Anything else? I see. No, I think that's it. Me. Okay, I've written all of that down. 
I will definitely incorporate these things into my next seminar. Thank you. I see. You're welcome. As you can see from the example, there are a lot of things that your inner coach observes about how to improve your performance in future situations. The problem, up until now, is that it has been presenting the information as a judgment. Once you switch the conversation to a non-emotional discussion of improvement opportunities, the experience changes from a negative to a positive one. And here's a valuable tip. Because research on memory tells us that a new idea lasts for only about 40 seconds in short-term memory and then it is gone, it is important to write down these ideas from your inner coach and put them in a file that you will review before your next performance. Otherwise, you may lose the benefit of the valuable feedback. Use EFT tapping to transform your inner critic. Another powerful way to transform your inner critic into an inner coach is to use the tapping technique outlined in my book, Tapping into Ultimate Success. This specific tapping protocol is designed to turn your critic into a supportive ally by redefining its role. See pages 121 to 126 of Tapping into Ultimate Success, How to Overcome Any Obstacle and Skyrocket Your Results by Jack Canfield and Pamela Bruner. Principle 33 Transcend Your Limiting Beliefs Your subconscious mind does not argue with you. It accepts what your conscious mind decrees. If you say, I can't afford it, your subconscious mind works to make it true. Select a better thought. Decree, I'll buy it. I accept it in my mind. Dr. Joseph Murphy, author of The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. Many of us have beliefs that limit our success. Whether they are beliefs about our own capabilities, beliefs about what it takes to succeed, beliefs about how we should relate with other people or even common everyday myths that modern-day science or research studies have long since refuted. Moving beyond your limiting beliefs is a critical first step toward becoming more successful. You can learn how to identify those beliefs that are limiting you and then replace them with positive ones that support your success. You are capable. One of the most prevalent and destructive limiting beliefs is the notion that somehow we are not capable of accomplishing our goals. Despite the best educational materials available, and despite decades of recorded knowledge about how to accomplish any task, we somehow choose to say instead, I can't do that. I don't know how. There's no one to show me. I'm not smart enough. On and on. Where does this come from? For most of us, it's a matter of early childhood programming. Whether they know it or not, our parents, grandparents, and other adult role models told us, No, no, honey, that's too much for you to handle. Let me do that for you. Maybe next year you can try that. We take this sense of inability into adulthood, where it gets reinforced through workplace mistakes and other failures. But what if you decided to say instead, I can do this. I am capable. Other people have accomplished this? If I don't have the knowledge, there's someone out there who can teach me. You make the shift to competence and mastery. The shift in thinking can mean the difference between a lifetime of could-have-dones and accomplishing what you really want in life. You are capable and worthy of love. Likewise, many people don't believe they are competent to handle life's challenges or are worthy of love. Yet these two beliefs are the two main pillars of high self-esteem. Believing that you are capable of handling anything that comes up in your life means that you are no longer afraid of anything. And think about this. Haven't you handled everything that has ever happened to you? Things that were far more difficult than you thought they would be? The death of a loved one. Divorce. Being broke. Loss of a friend. Your job. Your money. Your reputation your youth. These things were tough, but you handled them, and you can handle anything else that happens to you as well. Once you get that, 
your confidence will soar. Believing you are worthy of love means that you believe, I deserve to be treated well, with respect and dignity. I deserve to be cherished and adored by someone. I am worthy of an intimate and fulfilling relationship. I won't settle for less than I deserve. I will do whatever it takes to create that for myself. You can overcome any limiting belief. We suffer from other limiting beliefs, too. Do these sound familiar? I'm not smart, attractive, rich, old, or young enough. I'm not lovable. I'm not worthy. I'm not safe. Life is hard. They'd never pick me to head the new project. Even if I don't like this job, I need the financial security. Nothing I do is ever successful. Can't get rich in this profession. There aren't any good men left in this town. How to Overcome Any Limiting Belief Here is a simple but powerful four-step process you can use to transform any limiting belief into an empowering belief. 1. Identify a limiting belief that you want to change. Start by making a list of any beliefs you have that might be limiting you. A fun way to do that is to invite two or three friends who would also like to accelerate their growth to join you to brainstorm a list of all the things you heard growing up from your parents, guardians, teachers, coaches, even well-meaning religious instructors, such as the nuns in Catholic school, that might somehow still be limiting you. Here are some common ones and the limiting beliefs that grow out of them. Money doesn't grow on trees. I'll never be rich. Can't you do anything right? I can't do anything right, so why even try? Children should be seen and not heard. I need to be quiet if I want to be loved. Eat everything on your plate. Children in China are starving. I should eat everything on my plate, even if I'm not hungry. Boys don't cry. It's not okay to share my feelings, especially my sadness. Act like a lady. It's not okay to act playful, silly, sexual, spontaneously. The only person you ever think about is yourself. It's not okay to focus on my own needs. You're not smart enough to go to college. I'm stupid. I'm not college material. If you're not a virgin, nobody will want to marry you. I am damaged goods, and no one will ever love me. People aren't interested in your problems. I should hide what is really going on with me. Nobody's interested in your opinion. What I think is not important. When you are finished creating your list, pick a belief that you think is still limiting you and take yourself through the remaining three steps of the process. 2. Determine how the belief limits you. 3. Decide how you'd rather be, act, or feel. 4. Create a turnaround statement that affirms or gives you permission to be, act, or feel this new way. For example, 1. My negative limiting belief is, I have to do everything by myself. It's not okay to ask for help. It is a sign of weakness. 2. The way it limits me is, I don't ask for help, and I end up not meeting deadlines, staying up too late, and not making enough time for myself. 3. The way I want to feel is that it's okay to ask for help. It does not make me weak. It takes courage to ask for help. I ask for help when I need it, and I want to delegate to others some of the things I don't like doing and that are not the best use of my time. 4. My turnaround statement is, It's okay to ask for help. I am worthy of receiving all the support I need. Here are some other examples of turnaround statements. Negative. It's not okay to focus on my own needs. Turnaround. My needs are just as important as everyone else's needs. Negative. If I express my true feelings, people will think I am weak and take advantage of me. Turnaround. The more I express my true feelings, the more people love, respect, 
and support me. Negative. I can't do anything right, so why even try? Turn around. I can do many things right, and each time I try something new, I learn and get better. Once you have created a new belief, your turnaround statement, you will need to implant it into your subconscious mind through constant repetition several times a day for a minimum of 30 days. Use the affirmation techniques we discussed in Principle 10. Release the brakes. As Claude Bristol points out in his magnificent book, The Magic of Believing, this subtle force of repeated suggestion overcomes our reason. It acts directly on our emotions and our feelings, and finally penetrates to the very depths of our subconscious minds. It's the repeated suggestion that makes you believe. Principle 34 Develop four new success habits a year. The individual who wants to reach the top in business must appreciate the might and force of habit. He must be quick to break those habits that can break him, and hasten to adopt those practices that will become the habits that help him achieve the success he desires. J. Paul Getty, founder of Getty Oil Company, philanthropist, and in the late 1950s was widely regarded as the richest man in the world. Psychologists tell us that up to 90% of our behavior is habitual. 90%. From the time you get up in the morning until the time you retire at night, there are hundreds of things you do the same way every day. These include the way you shower, dress, eat breakfast, read the newspaper, brush your teeth, drive to work, organize your desk, shop at the supermarket, and clean your house. Over the years, you have developed a set of firmly entrenched habits that determine how well every area of your life works, from your job and your income to your health and your relationships. The good news is that habits help free up your mind while your body is on automatic. This allows you to plan your whole day while you are in the shower and talk with your fellow passengers while you are driving your car. The bad news is that you can also become locked into habits that don't serve you, unconscious, self-defeating behavior patterns that inhibit your growth and limit your success. Whatever habits you have established up to this point are producing your current level of results. More than likely, if you want to create higher levels of success, you are going to need to drop some of your habits, not returning phone calls, staying up too late, watching too much television, making sarcastic comments, eating fast food every day, smoking, being late for appointments, spending more than you earn, and replace them with more productive habits. Returning phone calls within 24 hours, getting eight hours of sleep each day, reading for an hour a day, exercising four times a week, eating healthy food, being on time, and saving 10% of your income. Good or bad, habits always deliver results. Success is a matter of understanding and religiously practicing specific, simple habits that always lead to success. Robert J. Ringer, author of Million Dollar Habits Your habits determine your outcomes. Successful people don't just drift to the top. Getting there requires focused action, personal discipline, and lots of energy every day to make things happen. The habits you develop from this day forward will ultimately determine how your future unfolds. One of the problems for people with poor habits is that the results of their bad habits usually don't show up until much later in life. When you develop a chronic bad habit, life will eventually give you consequences. You may not like the consequences, but life will still deliver them. The fact is, if you keep on doing things a certain way, you will always get a predictable result. Negative habits breed negative consequences. Positive habits create positive consequences. Take action to develop better habits now. There are two action steps for changing your habits. The first step is to make a list of all the habits that keep you unproductive or that might negatively impact your future. Ask others to help you objectively identify what they believe are your limiting habits. Look for patterns. Also, review this list of the most common unsuccessful habits below. Procrastinating. Paying bills at the last minute. 
not delivering on promised documents and services in a timely way, letting receivables get overdue, arriving late for meetings and appointments, forgetting someone's name within seconds of being introduced, talking over others' comments instead of listening, answering the telephone during family time or spouse time, handling mail more than once, working late, choosing work over time with your children, having fast food meals more than two days a week. Once you have identified your negative habits, the second step is to choose better, more productive success habits and develop systems that will help support them. For example, if your goal is to get to the gym every morning, one system you might put in place is to go to bed one hour earlier and set your alarm ahead. If you're in sales, you might develop a checklist of activities so that all prospects receive the same series of communications. Maybe you want to get in the habit of completing your work by the close of Business Friday, so you're free to spend weekends with your spouse and children. That's an excellent habit. But what specifically will you do to adopt that new habit? What activities will you engage in? How will you stay motivated? Will you develop a checklist of what must be accomplished by Friday afternoon to keep you on track? Will you spend less time chatting with co-workers at the water cooler? Email people their promised documents as you are talking on the phone with them? Take shorter lunches. What could you achieve if you took on four new habits a year? If you use these strategies to develop just four new habits a year, five years from now you'll have 20 new success habits that could bring you all the money you want, the wonderful loving relationships you desire, a healthier, more energized body, plus all sorts of new opportunities. Start by listing four new habits you would like to establish in the next year. Work on one new habit every quarter. If you work diligently on building one new habit every 13 weeks, you won't overwhelm yourself with an unrealistic list of New Year's resolutions. And research now shows that if you repeat a behavior for 13 weeks, whether it is meditating for 20 minutes a day, flossing your teeth, reviewing your goals, or writing thank you letters to your clients, it will be yours for life. By systematically adding one behavior at a time, you can dramatically improve your overall lifestyle. Here are a couple of hints for making sure you follow through on your commitment to your new habit. Put up signs to remind you to follow through on the new behavior. When I learned that even a little dehydration can decrease your mental acuity by as much as 30%, I decided to develop the habit that all of the health practitioners have been advising, drink 10 8-ounce glasses of water a day. I put signs that said, drink water, on my phone, my office door, my bathroom mirror, and my kitchen refrigerator. I also had my secretary remind me every hour. Another powerful technique to keep you focused on your new habit is to partner up with someone, keep score, see Principle 21, and hold each other accountable. Check in with each other at least once a week to make sure you are staying on track. Perhaps the most powerful way to stay on track is to follow the no exceptions rule, which is explained in the next chapter. Principle 35 99% is a bitch, 100% is a breeze. There is a difference between interest and commitment. When you're interested in doing something, you do it only when it's convenient. When you're committed to something, you accept no excuses, only results. Ken Blanchard Chief Spiritual Officer of the Ken Blanchard Companies and co-author of over 30 books, including the classic bestseller, The One-Minute Manager. In life, the spoils of victory go to those who make 100% commitment to the outcome, to those who have a no-matter-what-it-takes attitude. They give it their all. They put everything they have into getting their desired result, whether it be an Olympic gold medal, the top sales award, a perfect dinner party, an A in microbiology, or their dream house. What a simple concept this is, yet you'd be surprised how many people wake up every day and fight with themselves over whether or not to keep their commitments, stick to their disciplines, or carry out their action plans. The No Exceptions Rule Successful people adhere to the No Exceptions Rule when it comes to their daily disciplines. 
Once you make a 100% commitment to something, there are no exceptions. It's a done deal. Non-negotiable. Case closed. If I make a 100% commitment to monogamy, for example, that's it. I never have to think about it again. There are no exceptions, no matter what the circumstances. It ends the discussion, closes the door, permits no other possibility. I don't have to wrestle with that decision every day. It's already been made. The die has been cast. All the bridges are burned. It makes life easier and simpler, and keeps me on focus. It frees up tons of energy that would otherwise be spent internally debating the topic over and over and over, because all the energy I expend on internal conflict is now available to use for creating other achievement. If you make the 100% commitment to exercise every day for 30 minutes, no matter what, then it is settled. You simply just do it. It doesn't matter if you are traveling, if you have a 7 a.m. television interview, if it's raining outside, if you went to bed late last night, if your schedule is full, or if you simply don't feel like it. You just do it anyway. It's like brushing your teeth before you go to bed. You always do it, no matter what. If you find yourself in bed and you have forgotten, you get out of bed and brush them. It doesn't matter how tired you are or how late it is. You just do it. Whether your discipline is to read for an hour, practice the piano five days a week, make two sales calls every day, learn a new language, practice typing, hit 200 golf balls, do 50 sit-ups, run six miles, meditate, pray, read the Bible, spend 60 quality minutes with your kids, or whatever else you need to do to achieve your goals, commit 100% to those daily disciplines that will get you there.